Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a special R. Sinclair. Uh, we just wanted to put a little show out here uh, to uh, celebrate uh, the life of the great man, Sir Clive Sinclair, who just passed away a few days ago. And we thought it would be uh, a good idea to have a little bit of a talk about uh, Sir Clive uh, what he did for the uh, industry, uh, what he was about, what we liked about him, especially as two Americans, since we're sort of out of the loop on this sort of thing, aren't we, Bode? Absolutely. But we, uh, we we dig it, you know. So I've got a little fact sheet up here, just some Sir Clive uh, facts. A lot of it might be fun to go through, Bode. Uh, as you can see there on the screen, if you're watching this, uh, Sir Clive born uh, July 30th, 1940, Near Richmond, Surrey, England. Where's that at, Bo? Have you been near there? No idea. Surrey? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one either. Uh, Clive, and this was a surprise to me, Bo. Uh, Sir Clive uh, founded Sinclair Radionics in July of 1961, Bo. What do you think of that? Who would have thought Pretty that? early on. Yeah. Uh, in 60 he, was, he was just 21 years old. Yeah, he's a young man. Uh, in 72, yeah. Sir Clive introduced the first pocket calculator boat, which is kind of yeah. neat. Think about that for a minute. That's more than just kind of neat. That's that's a world-changing event. You know, just think about the pocket calculator. Yeah. Things that you'd have to do longhand or with a cumbersome slide rule, yeah. you now have is something you can carry in your pocket uh, to do, you know, to do arithmetic on. That it's hard to imagine a time when something like that didn't exist. Yeah, and there it is. The, if you're watching the video portion, this is a is a uh, calculator there with the, and that's just that's as basic as it comes. You know, we, uh, I, I don't know, you're not old enough to remember when calculators were huge, <laughs> but I am. They were huge. You plugged them in with like a wall socket back in the day, mm -hmm. and it was so. I don't remember the first time we had these, and then you end up having the solar ones, that were really uh, very neat. At the time, you're like you couldn't believe it because you felt like very felt very futuristic boat uh, when those came around. Um, so, Sir Clive in uh, April of 1980 uh, debuted the uh, the Sinclair Pocket Micro, and then in November he revealed his plans for the original ZX80 expansion. Uh, so early in. Here was he was going to work. Now we, uh, me and the Brent have done a show on the ZX80 back in the day, and that that vacuum uh, uh, sealed that you know this vacuum made case for it. It's mm -hmm. as flimsy as heck, both this thing. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I've handled several of these. Oh really? And it's always it's always startling to me lifting one up because it feels like it, it feels like it's going to fall apart in your hands. Yeah, yeah. The the plastic is so thin, but you know what did you get at that what did you get you got a computer yeah so you didn't care how flimsy the where did you where was. did you usually at the at ireland is that where you saw one uh no i think i saw the first one i saw actually was at an exhibit when i was in york oh i see um, yeah. they had a computer exhibit and then one of my professors actually pulled one of these things out of a drawer when I told him I was into old computers yeah. and stuff, this was way before we started the show or anything. Yeah. And uh, one of my professors at Sheffield kept one of these around. And they, yeah, they're, they're just extremely, extremely small, flimsy devices. Now, of course, uh, the ZX80, ZX81, these were, these were uh, you know, obviously they were low-powered machine, but these fit Sir Clive's angle, which was mass-producing things that were affordable, and not necessarily at the top of the field. This was a pretty mm -hmm. good strategy, especially if in a time, if you'll recall, the the early 80s in the UK was not what I would call economic boom time. Like, they yeah, were getting was, killed was... over there. Unemployment mm -hmm. was off the charts, uh, and they were they were having a real rough go of it. So you needed that affordable uh, sort of uh, electronic device. Now, I will say Sugar, you know, also did sort of the same thing with his company, with the radios and stuff. It was They made kind of lower-end stuff. And that's how they made their money. That's how they plied their trade boat. So it worked mm -hmm. out pretty well. Now, of course, we know that eventually uh, the ZX-81 was launched in uh, March of 81, and the Spectrum was announced in uh, 82, April of 82, uh, the ZX Spectrum. Now, of course, this is the machine we are most familiar with boat, uh, would be the Speccy. Uh, we float this thing a lot. And, of course, the, the, the variants of it, uh, the, the pluses and whatnot, uh, when you first, I remember when we first got our ZX, 
Uh, we were surprised at how small it was, weren't we? And, and I mean, it's built well, but the keyboard, the size of it. Uh, do you remember what you thought when that thing, when we unwrapped that on the show all those years ago? I think, you know, was it the Huck that sent that up here, Bo? Yeah, Gary Hucker sent that to us. Thank you, Gary. Um, the When I saw it, I was struck by two things. One, it was the first piece of electronics I think I've ever owned outside of like a toaster or something. Definitely not a computer that had no on off switch. You know, you're just expected to plug the lead directly into the back. Yeah. Uh, it was also the first computer that I ever saw that gave you no indication that the computer was running. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> there's, yes. There's there's no LED to tell you that the machine is switched on. And that would now, be course, its downfall both, in your hands. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Because. So both of these things, of course, were cost-cutting measures. Yeah. But at the same time, I was struck by you know how versatile the little computer was by the way that they used the shift key and they printed all the commands on the on yeah. the on the on the on the keyboard itself that was super clever, the way that by by default when you load up the spectrum you know you don't just type on it like you do an atari or a commodore keyboard yeah. it's set up by default where j is load you know yeah. and, and stuff like that so um i was struck by the size yeah. definitely um when i was a kid my dad had an atari portfolio do you know what an atari portfolio is oh gosh i I vaguely remember the name, but now we're off the top of my head. What what is it? This was a this was a little pocket sized computer, not unlike the TRS eighty model one hundred. Yeah, yeah I think. that we covered yeah. on ARG. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that's different was it was a clamshell model. It had a better screen. It was just a newer device. But that was up to that point. That was the smallest computer I think I'd ever seen. Yeah. And this thing, it's it it was just amazingly small, but it had that nice metal body. It yeah. definitely felt uh, more solid than the ZX eighty. Oh gosh, sure. yeah, yeah, by leagues, I agree with that and but again this followed the same philosophy and we know firsthand just from doing our shows and talking to our friends how influential the uh the the, the zx was um and clearly this is a lot of people's first machine over in the uk and other parts of the world i mean it, gosh it went everywhere right russia and mm -hmm. all of europe even huge we got in it. portugal yeah yeah, uh, yeah we got the Tomex and clear version which was you know kind of crap uh, but mm -hmm. it, we did get it over here uh, and, of course, this went on uh, quite nicely. It's funny that ultimately you ended up selling, uh, he ended up selling this whole kit and caboodle to Amstrad, uh, you know, and, and it's strange how that all went down. But, I mean, it wasn't, uh, it you know, these things happen in the computer game. Gosh knows, we, me and Brent cover so many of these, just like Ohio Scientific. Machines rise and fall, and companies rise and fall depending on the, the way things go. It doesn't lessen the impact of the machine or the memories of the machine. Just a, it's sort of just sort of another uh, generation of the machine. And of course, they kept the spectrum going uh, even after. Oh yeah, after I mean, was, uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of people would consider the the golden years of spectrum gaming at least happened entirely under the the sugar reign. Right. You know, that was when the, the the plus two and the plus three were released, and uh, and you know the majority of the 128k models came after. The sugar acquisition. You know, so. we should mention the great film uh, Micro Men, which sort of chronicled uh, some of the early days over there. I believe, as I recall, that was the film that was chronicling the fight to become the BBC computer. Correct. And Correct. Uh, uh, our, there's that famous one where Sir Clive portraying that talks about Jet Set Willie. It's one of my all time favorite <laughs> lines from any film. Sir, mm -hmm. One thing that we, we should mention about uh, Sir Clive is that. He was a great idea guy, and he had his hands in a lot of this stuff. But when it came to the computer side of things, he knew what he wanted. He knew what he the prices he wanted. He knew what he wanted it to look like to a certain degree. But pretty much, he left the he would set the parameters and then let his engineers go to work. And mm -hmm. famously, he would set parameters that were unbelievably unobtainable. And then he would basically have his people try to figure them out. And uh, uh, by God. You've got to give credit to the the engineers and the and the geniuses that he got together at Sinclair to pull some of this stuff off, which often yeah. seemed completely ludicrous. Yeah, and, much like much like Steve Jobs gets yeah. a lot of credit for what went on at Apple. The real blood, sweat, and tears uh, went on. Uh, I, Clive had some to do with it, but the majority were the people that were working under him, making his vision come to life. It's funny though, if you think about this, folks. I was pondering this today on my long drive, so. Here you've got a guy who's not computer savvy, right? And he's running this show, mm -hmm. and he can make he can make demands that 
seem ridiculous, but because he doesn't know what he's asking, if he's got people that he pays enough money that are smart enough and talented enough, they can try to fulfill even his wackiest ideas. They don't have yeah. much of a choice because if they can't do it, he'll find some suckers that can. And so in some ways, having a guy at the top that only has a, a, a marginal idea of what's going on with what you're working with probably isn't the worst idea in a weird way. Uh, very strange. Now, let's get to what me and you both enjoy uh, from Sir Clive and talk about the Sinclair C5. Uh, launched in 1985. This was now he did have his grubby hands all over this one. The old Clivester, he was all up in this one boat. This was his electric vehicle. The first, this was to be the first mass produced electric vehicle in the UK. Uh, it was a if you haven't seen one of these, a white, uh, sort of like uh, I'm hard to explain what these look like. It looks like a, it, <laughs> it's lo like a it side looks like car. a it, it looks like a sidecar cross with a green, uh, a green, or what was it called? The big green machine? Well, it's bigger. One of those big wheel things? <laughs> yes. And, and the funny thing about these is that they, of course, that you you sort of pedaled them, and the handlebars were down around your knees or, or like, you know, at your calves. Uh, they're very unusual looking uh, gimmick. And I believe the early engines on these ran on modified Hoover vacuum cleaner motors, if mm. you can believe that. But these were going to be a big deal uh, when, when they came out. Uh, and uh, they were highly touted. And, I mean, Clive was really into these things, too. I mean, this was his baby, uh, for sure. Uh, and But ultimately, they did not do well. And one of the big reasons is uh, they were sort of dangerous uh, boat. Uh, they are they're, they set low to the ground, lower than a bike. And there was a fear that lorries and, and, and other cars would just run these suckers over. Right. And and of course, the, the, the launch of the event was a PR disaster. They decided that the, the, the dead of winter was a perfect time to launch an open air vehicle for people to, to ride around yes. in. So they hired all of these very pretty models and they dressed them in parkas and, and ponchos and they sent them off. And uh, and that you can look at their faces. They they don't look comfortable when they're riding around in yeah. these things. So the launch was a disaster. Uh, it was an idea that whose time had not yet come. You know, obviously we look at the EV market now. It's taken off like gangbusters. This was just an idea that wasn't quite ready for prime time. Yeah, yet. and he had a couple ideas like this. Some of his ideas were hits. Some weren't. That that one wasn't. He also did this uh, this micro size TV. It was the first one around. And it did also not do well. Uh, the uh, it just didn't sell well. It wasn't. I mean, it was early, early days for one of these portable. Mm. Have you ever had one of these little portable handheld TVs? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, now, when I had one, though, it was not a CRT. It was an early, early, early LCD uh, right. handheld TV. Yeah. So th these are. I think they're kind of neat. Now he did. Yeah, have, they he are did very have cool. Some hits though. He had an electric bike that did uh, uh, that uh, fared better than C5. The C5 mm -hmm. is what, uh, sort of people look on that like this was the big downfall or whatever. And I can't say with these certainty that's what killed the company or whatever. But they, they did put a lot of resources behind it. It didn't get over. I mean, in the first year, they expected to sell 100,000 of these. And I think they sold like 15,000 of them before it was all put to bed. Uh, but the one thing you got to say uh, about Sir Clive is that he was in there trying. He was inventing. He was trying to be creative. He was mm -hmm. trying to find things that would appeal to that low end market, uh, and trying to think outside the box. And I think if 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 you look at a guy like him, you're not going to call him like the big time inventor because that would. But he is the idea, uh, ultimate idea guy, wouldn't you say? Yes, absolutely. You know, you need to have somebody with engineering experience, a combination of engineering experience and ideas. I mean, it's it's a lot like Edison. You know, yep. Edison was an inventor, but Edison also was a great entrepreneur. And uh, and that and that's why we remember him and not all the thousands of people that that were also great inventors. Yeah. Um, you know, Clive, he had a look about him. He you know, he he was a recognizable figure. He, he had a friendly face. Yeah. You know, people people tended to to kind of see him as, as sort of a fatherly figure, especially, you know, kids that that were that grew up using spectrums. Yeah. And so that's why his death has really affected as many people as, as it has is because you kind of look at the guy and you kind of see somebody that was out there trying to do new things and trying to bring it to a public that could afford yeah. it. And I will say, you know, he was. We call him Sir Clive because he was knighted in, in 1982, which is a um, a huge deal, and that shows you the kind of jack that that Sir Clive had. 
I mean, he got mm-hmm. knighted. They don't just throw those yeah. things around, brother. This guy was well respected. He was at the top of his game back in those days. You know, it's hard to stay on top. You know, and he, you know, word on the street is up until just the past few weeks, he was still inventing. You know, being creative, which is that's a. Uh, comforting to know mm-hmm. about one of the things i didn't know about him here in just because i saw this in closing i thought this was interesting uh he was a big time poker player and he was in three series of late night poker on channel four wow i had no idea i did not either he won, since <laughs> he won the first series final celebrity poker club i thought it was great too he was also a member of mensa that explains okay. a lot so well, that yeah. you're talking about a guy here that had a uh, talent uh to spare you know, and we, you know, we are, as Americans, again, this didn't get a whole lot of press over here in the States because most people over here aren't familiar with the ZX or, or Sir Clive. And me and Boat, let's be honest, Boat, me and Hit, you knew didn't know a whole lot about the whole thing until we started the show. Uh, right. But we learned something. We learned, what we learned was the ZX is a, is a great machine. The whole family is a lot of fun. And, and the image of Sir Clive, Sir Clive and his C5, Sir Clive jumping over computers, Sir Clive... Just being him, just it, there's mm-hmm. there, the man had something. I can't put my finger on, but it was it, it just he's a very comforting guy to look at. I don't know what it is. Yes, and that's he, it, man. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah, he will be missed, won't he, Bode? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. in closing, fond adieu to Sir Clive, and hopefully, when he's on his C five up in heaven, boat, uh, the wind is down, the road is clear, and it's smooth sailing for the great man. Adios.